We'll get the recording going and then we'll get started here. Um, we do record this so that everyone can watch it after, share with friends, family, colleagues. Um, and then during the meeting, we do ask that you stay muted so we don't hear background noise as we're uh, presenting. And we do ask that you leave your cameras off that can help with our bandwidth and distractions um, in case anyone has a lot going on where they're tuning in from. We are going to have uh, the ability for you to all submit questions into your chat box this evening. We'll do the best we can to answer those questions. Um, like I mentioned before, we do have a lot to cover, so it's possible we won't get to very many questions tonight, but don't worry. We are going to give you a lot of resources that will be available to you because we want everyone to really be engaged uh, this season. And Andrea is going to go over some great ways that you can follow up with us after this webinar, things you can do during the session to be active and available. And we would do send out an evaluation after the webinar. We want to hear how we're doing and also see if you have any ideas for upcoming webinars. We're always looking for new ideas. Just quick information about us in case you haven't heard of us before. We're a nonprofit organization. That's the voice for all of New Hampshire's 1,000 lakes. And our mission is to restore and preserve the health of New Hampshire's lakes. And we do that through our programs, our advocacy program, which you'll hear all about tonight, our conservation program, which uh, many of you may have seen our lake hosts out at boat ramps, helping prevent the spread of invasive species, as well as our Lake Smart program. Um, that's great for any homeowner or even business owner. If you're interested in learning more, you can do on your property to help protect our lakes and our outreach program, which is bringing you our webinar tonight. And you can support all of these programs and all of our efforts to help protect our lakes by becoming a supporter. And you can do that right on our lake, on our website at uh, newhampshirelakes.org, donate. So your hosts this evening are myself, I'm the outreach manager here at New Hampshire Lakes and Bria Arvidsson, who's our brand new director of programs. Welcome to the team, Bria. And without further ado, I present Andrea Lamaru, who many of you probably know, and she will go over all the interesting stuff that we have for you tonight. Great, thank you, Erin. Uh, can you hear me okay? I can hear you, okay. great. And I'm gonna pull up my slides here, move everyone's face around. Okay, and how does that look? It looks Perfect. Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you're in the comfort of your home, uh, out of the rain and slush, and um, maybe having dinner and a glass of wine or, or something. And thank you for sharing an hour of your evening with, uh, with me and, and my team. And I just want to say welcome to a few special people. We have a couple different board members um, tuning in today, including Bruce Freeman, our chair, um, direct the board uh, chair and Bruce joined me this morning for about three hours at the uh, state house on a, on a bill. Um, so thank you, Bruce. And um, we have uh, a number of our Lake Advocate Network uh, representatives representing uh, about 20 different lake associations throughout the state and a couple state representatives on the on the call tonight as well. Thank you so much. I know you all have had a really busy past couple of days start to the session and then a number of uh, supporters, New Hampshire Lake supporters. Um, so thank you so much, all of you for tuning in. Uh, so the objective of this evening is to give you a, a preview um, but I'm actually changing that to a view of the New Hampshire legislative session because we have already started. We, um, the New Hampshire Lakes team, we've already been to four, four hearings. Um, so what I want to do uh, tonight is, first of all, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the New Hampshire State Legislature, it's a pretty uh, unique and amazing place. And just wanted to give you an overview of of the legislature, how it, what it's made up of, and. Um, couple in and how the process works and then we'll get into some of the bills that New Hampshire Lakes is focusing on uh, this session relative to our lakes and again as Aaron said then we'll we'll finish up with um, some resources for you all to get informed stay informed and then take action 
I should also mention you will receive, uh, I think Aaron did mention this, a recording and uh, slides as well for this. So the New Hampshire legislature, it's a pretty unique place. It is the second largest legislative body in the United States, second only to Congress. We have 400 state representatives. Um, so it, there's a huge opportunity. We have a citizen legislature and we have a huge opportunity here in New Hampshire. Uh, to participate in the process. 400 state house representatives, 24 senators. Um, our legislators are elected and serve for two year terms. Um, we are now in the second year of a biennium. And this legislature uh, just started meeting, uh, you know, kicked off January 3rd, and then they'll be doing uh, their thing uh, probably until June. So pretty, pretty unique place. This here is a picture of uh, Representatives Hall in the State House. And I do encourage you, if you've never been um, to the Legislative Office Building or the State House, to come on down sometime this session. There'll be plenty of opportunity. Um, the architecture alone is pretty interesting, as is the process. So this second year of the biennium, the 169th session of the New Hampshire Legislature, approximately 1,400 bills. 1400 bills are going to be considered uh, by our legislators. And if you're wondering, that is a huge amount and is, is larger than normal. So our, our representatives um, are very busy. So Andrea, some people might be wondering, how does a bill become a law in New Hampshire? I'm very glad you asked, Aaron. And for those of you, hopefully some of you in the audience uh, can uh, remember this, this cartoon here, the I'm a bill, just only a bill sitting here on Capitol Hill. Uh, many of you are probably um, familiar with Schoolhouse Rocks. I know I grew up with that. Um, so what we're going to do is our, our version of how a bill uh, becomes a law here in New Hampshire. Uh, okay, and this is a, a pretty complicated process. I'm just going to hit the high points here just so you guys get a get an idea of, of what is involved. Uh, so how a bill becomes a law here in New Hampshire. The first step is introducing a bill. So only a state representative um, of the House or a state senator may sponsor a bill. And what they do back in the fall, and even actually during the summer, they start talking to their constituents and stakeholder groups about ideas for bills. And then in the fall, they submit what's called legislative service requests. These are basically precursors to bills. They're ideas for bills. They're and during this process, they submit basically the title of the bill to the Office of Legislative Services. So um, sometime in November-ish, this big list starts coming out of all these different titles for bill ideas. Um, and it's publicly, um, it's shared with the public. And that's when we start our work, um, me and my team, and we start looking at all these titles and trying to figure out what bills might have to do with lakes. All right, next slide. So um, then sometime um, in December, potentially early January, but it was mostly December this year, um, the titles then actually become bills. Bill text is released. Um, and so if a sp if the sponsor of the bill was, if, the, if a House representative submitted a bill, a, a, um, submitted a LSR, a legislative service re request for a bill, that bill will start in the House, in the House of Representatives, and it's called a House bill. If the sponsor was a senator, the bill starts in the Senate and becomes a Senate bill, and they are assigned numbers. So we have these two chambers, the House and the Senate. Um, so what we were doing uh, leading up to the holiday break is checking that, that list and seeing what what LSRs became bills and figuring out what their numbers are and then reading the text and really trying to figure out what each of these bills were about are about. Okay, step three, um, the bill is then assigned to a committee um, and the House of Representatives, uh, remember we have 400 representatives here. Uh, the House is bigger than the Senate um, so the House has many more committees. Uh, so they have 28 standing committees, and these committees uh, deal with different topics. Uh, we spend, New Hampshire Lakes spends a lot of time in with bills that are introduced to the, into the House Resources, um, Resources and Development Committee. Um, 
And so the picture on the left there is is inside of the legislative office building. Um, and that is a um, House committee. House committees are usually bigger than Senate committees. Um, and one thing I will notice for those of you who are familiar with the legislature and have been there, because there are so many bills this year, they're having to hold um, generally more hearings during a day. And so um, today on a sort of contentious bill, which probably in previous years would have been heard in a big room, a double room. Um, today, that bill was heard in a single room, again, because they're just having to make sure they get all of these hearings done. Um, and, and so they need more committee meeting space. So as a uh, so step four, um, so each bill in New Hampshire, this is unique, each bill in New Hampshire gets a hearing, a public hearing, and I mentioned 1,400 bills, that's 1,400 or so hearings, and so that's what we are busy doing now, uh, you know, once the session kicked off um, in January 3rd, uh, we are waiting to hear when hearings are going to be announced um, for the various bills that we are following, and hearings uh, need to be announced at least 72 hours in, in advance. And uh, they're usually announced on Friday, which means this past Friday when we, uh, last week we found out on Friday that we had three bills this week on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So that was a really, really short turnaround. Um, but sometimes we do find out before 72 hours, which is much more preferable so that we can get the word out to, to folks like you if we're recommending some sort of action. So at a public hearing, uh, the prime sponsor, the, the, the representative um, or senator who um, you know, submitted the bill um, will introduce the bill and explain it. And then the committee may have some um, experts come up and, and testify to uh, maybe state agency officials. Um, and then they'll um, any member of the public who has requested to speak um, will be provided an opportunity to testify. So the hearing I was at today, it kicked off with the prime sponsor, and then they had a couple of state agency folks talk, and then they went back and forth, uh, inviting those to testify, um, alternating between someone who supports it and then someone who opposes the bill. Um, and so we had a two an hour, almost two and a two hour and 15 minute hearing today um, when, and many folks uh, got to share their their thoughts with the House committee. So after the public hearing um, and after the committee reviews um, any online testimony that's submitted, um, they the committee amongst itself will go into an executive session. This might be right after the hearing, but usually it's a couple weeks after the hearing. And during that executive session, the committee talks amongst themselves to decide what they're going to recommend uh, for the bill. And they have a number of options. Um, and I won't go through all of these, but usually we're asking a, a committee to, um, to pass a bill. So we recommend um, a bill to ought to pass, ought to pass, or we recommend, you know, we're opposed to a bill. So a committee gets to decide, you know, ought to pass. Inexpedient to legislate is a fancy way of saying, this is not a good bill, we don't think it should pass. And then they have options to pass it, but with amendments, or maybe the bill needs some work, and um, they're going to re-refer it to a committee for work, or um, maybe they actually need to study the issue more before they, a bill is this bill can have more work. Sometimes a bill goes to a second committee. Um, if, for example, if there's a um, financial component to the bill, if you see a bill and it says like House Bill, I don't know, 1301-FN, FN means fiscal note. That means there's some sort of financial component to the bill and usually it will be referred to um, maybe the Ways and Means Committee or a Finance Committee. Okay. So we're getting through the process here. Um, okay, step six, floor vote. So the committee is going to recommend an action for the bill, and then that's gonna go to the full house or the full Senate, depending on what house the bill originated. It's going to go to the full um, full body for uh, to consider the committee's recommendation. 
Um, there are some sort of tweaks to this, but um, in general, uh, floor debate may follow and after debate, the full body will vote on the committee's decision. Um, and for you representatives in the, in the audience, I am not the expert here and I know I'm glossing over a few topics, but generally speaking, this is how the process works. All right, so floor vote. If the full body passes the bill, then that bill gets to get sent over to the other body. So if a house bill passes the full house, it's gonna then cross over um, to the Senate. Um, crossover is, it usually occurs in late March or early April. Um, and that is a time when, you know, there are gonna be many bills that are not going to, you know, pass the full body in which they started. So a lot of these house bills and we have, I think about eight or 900 house bills, um, probably a lot of those are gonna get that ITL, that inexpedient to legislate. So there will be fewer bills crossing over, um, you know, from the house to the Senate. Okay, so once that bill, you know, crosses over to the other legislative body, it's assigned a committee. Um, and again, we mentioned that there are fewer committees in the Senate and the committees are organized a little bit differently. But again, all those committees um, are based on um, sort of topic or subject matter area. And once again, they get a hearing. And then that second um, body, um, that committee votes on a recommendation. And then uh, they're going to then have the full body. So again, um, if it's the Senate that's considering the bill, you know, the second um, body to consider the bill, the committee recommends, and then the full Senate will, um, you know, vote on it. So very similar process, just happens twice. If the bill passes the second um, committee, the second House, um, but it includes an amendment. So if the second body passes a bill with an amendment, but that amendment was added after it got to the second, you know, um, body, the that bill then has to go back to the originating body, so the first legislative body, for approval of the amendment. Um, and the first body, legislative body, if they don't approve the amendment, then that bill has to go to a committee of conference. And again, I'm glossing over some of the details here, but basically representatives from each of the bodies um, you know, form this committee of conference and they try to hash it out. Um, and if the legislators cannot agree on an amend amended bill, the bill is going to die. Um, so a lot of, um, sometimes bills get a lot of debate, a lot of discussion. So if a bill happens to make it through all of those committees and all of those full house votes and all of that um, discussion, um, if it passes all of that, it will go to the governor. At that time, the governor has three choices. The governor can sign the bill into law. Um, they can allow the bill to become a law without their signature, um, or they can veto the bill. So, you know, say, nope, this is not a good bill. It's not going to become law. The governor's veto can be overridden um, by a two-thirds majority vote um, in both of the, ch both of the chamber, both of the, you know, the House and the Senate. And if an override occurs, the bill would become law. So of those 1,400 or so bills um, that are being introduced into the session uh, this year, 1,400 will not make it to the governor's desk. Um, a much smaller percentage uh, will make it for sure. And with that, I'm going to take a drink of water here. <laughs> so with all of that knowledge, what exactly is in store for our lakes this session? Well, that is a great question, Erin. Um, so again, we mentioned 1,400 bills, uh, New Hampshire lakes. We've been search, you know, looking through all of those bills and trying to figure out uh, what bills are related to lakes in one way, shape, or another. And what we're going to, what we're already doing, and we've been doing for a number of years, is mobilizing a statewide network of people, of lake advocates, to stand up for our lakes and give them a voice in the state, in the New Hampshire legislature. Um, on the New Hampshire Lakes staff, we have two lobbyists. Lobbyist is not a bad word. Um, lobbyist is just uh, myself and my uh, coworker, Bria, who's on this call, and we register with the state. Um, to then report the amount of time we spend on advocacy work. But we are basically, um, you know, 
working together uh, with various state representatives, various stakeholder agencies, and and lake associations and individuals, uh, many of you on this call today, um, to uh, get a large voice for our lakes. And we all know that our lakes, while we have some of the cleanest and healthiest lakes in the country, uh, they are changing and some of them are becoming very sick before our eyes. And we know that there's a number of ways to attack um, or, or help to restore and preserve the health of our lakes. And one of those ways is through um, uh, the state legislature. And this picture here on the left is Representative Rosemary Rung. And um, Representative Rosemary Rung is, is a champion for our lakes in the legislature. And, and she has um, introduced, oh my goodness, I don't know the number, more than a handful of bills um, for to restore and preserve the health of our lakes. And last session, we worked closely with Representative Rosemary Rung to get um, the Cyanobacteria Mitigation Loan and Grant Fund established in law. And for those of you not familiar with cyanobacteria, I'm glad you're not familiar with it. It means you haven't had a toxic bloom on your lake. But unfortunately, toxic cyanobacteria blooms um, are becoming more of an issue in New Hampshire. And it was really important last session to um, get a fund established to help local communities, lake associations, municipalities, water supply groups, um, get them some um, ability to get additional grants and loans to address the problems that are causing these blooms. And the reason that I have this picture here is representative wrong. We got that bill passed. Uh, well, we got that fund established through some, uh, <laughs> some um, various, it wasn't a straightforward process in the, but that bill, that fund became law and representative wrong um, said to us, thank you, because New Hampshire lakes is really making an impact, pulling together hundreds of people to submit online testimony, to sign in on bills, to come to hearings and share their personal stories. She's grateful for the work we've done and we've all done collectively for our lakes. Um, so together we're mobilizing this network. So um, what we do then, Erin, um, is we took a, you know, looked at all of the bills that have been introduced and we have to look at through the lens of what are the core issues to New Hampshire Lakes um, and um, the organization. Our mission is to preserve and protect um, our lakes and uh, we are a science-based organization and our core issues are um, for advocacy are the prevention and management of aquatic invasive species. Um, our, another one of our core issues is protecting um, shoreland and wetland resources. These resources, if managed um, to, to maintain their ecological functions can help to um, keep our lakes clean and healthy by filtering out pollutants and stopping polluted runoff water from going running into them. And another issue for us is actually water, qual water quality restoration and protection. And again, for those of you who aren't familiar with toxic, um, with cyanobacteria blooms, um, this here, picture here on the right is a picture of, which was later identified as a toxic bloom of cyanobacteria in a lake. Uh, so we are also um, looking at all these bills through the lens of, you know, is this bill going to impact aquatic invasive species prevention and management? Is this bill going to impact shoreland and wetland function uh, for the protection of water quality? And is this bill going to impact the quality of our lakes or our ability to restore and protect the quality of our lakes? So those are our core issues that we're looking at all of those 1400 bills through. And I will say that of the 1400 bills or so, uh, our team has identified about 50 bills. Yep, 5050 bills that we're going to keep track of in some way, shape or form over the next you know, January to May or so. Um, of those 50 bills, there are then um, about 15 bills that we're saying are, are our priority bills that they are, you know, really in, of those 50 bills, we have, you know, bills that are 
kind of indirectly related to water quality um, and shoreland protection and invasive species. But then we have about 15 that we think are high priority that are really directly related to you know, water quality, shoreland protection, um, or invasive species. Um, of those 15, tonight I'm going to talk about just a handful. If we were to go through all of our priority bills, you would need a couple glasses of wine um, and a later bedtime. Um, so I'm not going to do that to you, uh, but I will reassure you um, at the end of this presentation, you will have a link to our masterpiece tracking sheet, which has those 50 bills um, organized by priority um, and tells you how to find that bill, what that bill is about, who sponsored that bill, um, where that, you know, New Hampshire Lakes position on that bill. Um, and I will say the position, our positions on bills may change as the session goes on, as we learn things and as bills get amended. So um, we update our uh, tracking sheet daily. Um, and that tracking sheet will also let you know when a bill is going to be heard, where it's going to be heard, what time, what room, all of that. So I'm going to, I'm just giving a time check here, Erin, because I know I, I can talk people's ear off. Um, but what I'm going to do now, um, everyone, is just go through a handful of our priority bills. Um, and I'm going to start with this bill, House Bill 1304, uh, relative to basically registering boats in New Hampshire. And this is a bill, what is today? It's been a busy week. This is Wednesday. Um, yesterday, yesterday, Tuesday, um, I testified at the state the House of Representatives in the Transportation Committee. Yes, um, yesterday in support of this bill, uh, New Hampshire Lakes, along with uh, several other uh, agencies um, and stakeholder groups, is supportive of this bill. Um, and it's kind of complicated, but basically the way New Hampshire, when someone registers their boat in New Hampshire, presently, um, there's a fee for the registration and then there's a fee for that supports a number of other critical programs in New Hampshire related to boating. So um, when you register your boat, you're paying to register your boat, but then you're also paying to support um, the prevention and management of aquatic invasive species. You're paying to support search and rescue. Uh, you're paying to support a couple other things. And these are all what we believe are really critical programs and the primary funding for most of these, these critical programs through when someone registers their boat. However, for whatever reason, uh, the federal government, the Coast Guard, um, did an audit, a desk audit um, of, of a number of different states and found that New Hampshire lakes, uh, New Hampshire, the state of New Hampshire, by collecting boat registration fees and all these other fees at the same time in one transaction um, is a violation of federal law. Um, so this bill um, base, it proposes a way to fix that problem so that New Hampshire is not in violation and um, what it does is basically separates out those tra that transaction into two separate transactions that can still happen at the same time, um, but separates out those two transactions. It's kind of like when you register your car. If you live here in New Hampshire, you write you know, two checks, um, or at least I do, uh, one check to the state, one check to the town. Um, so it's a similar thing. You, you could pay them together or pay them separately. You have that option and you would get a second decal. So you would get the decal for boat registration, and then you'd get that boat fee decal for those other critical programs. Now, I know it sounds sort of ridiculous and no one wants two stickers on their boat, uh, but um, we would prefer, and it would be much easier just to continue the way we're doing it, but um, the feds told us that we can't. And if we don't fix it, our Marine Patrol is gonna lose a whole bunch of federal funding. Um, so with this bill, we're protecting federal funding for the Marine Patrol, which we all know is underfunded as it is. And it's also um, making it a law that um, voters have to pay these other fees. Well, that was a law before, but provides a way in which we, a legal way in which we can collect those fees. Um, so uh, long story short, I testified at the hearing, there was no opposition. And we think this one, you know, you never know what's gonna happen in the legislature and we will continue to follow it, but we're feeling good about this one. 
All right. So um, the next bill I wanted to bring up tonight, um, this is relative to shoreland and wetland protection. This is House Bill 1103. And it's titled relative to revising the penalties for the Shoreland Protection Act. So I'm going to warn you that sometimes when you look at a title of a bill, it's not exactly what the bill is about. Um, this bill does not change how much someone needs to pay if they violate the Shoreland Protection Act. That's not what this bill is about. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the Shoreland Protection Act, it's actually called um, Shoreland Water Quality Protection Act. Um, that is basically the act um, that regulates um, the different um, activities, um, development activities and fertilizer use and tree clearing um, within 250 feet of our lakes and, and our major rivers. Um, and it's a, you know, the intent of the law is very good to, um, you know, um, basically to protect uh, water quality. Some of you in the audience this evening may be familiar with the fact that it is difficult for the Department of Environmental Services to inf um, basically enforce fines. Um, you know, when they find a violation, it's very difficult for them to fine for that violation. We won't go into the whole reason why, but there's a number of um, impediments and, and sort of the burden of proof that the Department of Environmental Services um, has to prove for a and it, it's really um, too high of a bar. So what this this bill does is seeks to remove some of those impediments um, that makes it easier uh, for the department when they when there's a proven and known violation to actually issue a fine for it. Um, again, this does not change any of the fees. The fees stay the same if you were to violate. Um, but we're hopeful that because you know if if the department is able to more easily enforce the act and enforce violations, that that will serve as a deterrent for people to say, okay, you know, I actually can get fined for this and I might get in trouble. So hopefully it's a deterrent and therefore that it will strengthen the act and be more effective at protecting the quality of our lakes. This bill is being heard next Wednesday. Um, and so for those of you who are on um, receive our advocacy alert e-news, hopefully sometime this Friday, you're going to receive an alert from me about how you can support this bill. Um, so stay tuned for that one. Okay, this next one also related to shoreland and wetland protection, House Bill 1229 relative to the purchase and sale of property abutting public waters. Again, when you look at the title here, you're not really sure what this bill is going to be about. Um, but what I can tell you is, as best I understand it here, um, this bill is about when someone buys or leases or transfers a property um, in that shoreland area, so that 250 feet within a lake, a, you know, pond or a river, um, someone, you know, someone who's receiving that property needs to acknowledge, you know, at the time of closing, presumably, um, that they um, receive a document that fills them in about what the Shoreland Protection uh, Act is, the things in the you know, the things that they can do within, you know, those different setbacks in that 250 feet, you know, what they can and can't do relative to, say, fertilizer use, um, removal of vegetation, um, things like that. Um, so it's just, a, you know, a, an acknowledgement uh, when you, um, you know, tra are transferred when you receive that property. Um, and really, we support this. Um, it's going to be, we don't know when it's going to be heard yet. We haven't seen, at least I haven't yet seen the time for the, the date and time of the hearing. But we're supportive of this bill because um, it helps uh, educate um, folks um, that, you know, buy and receive property near these sensitive areas. It's another way, another opportunity um, to to hopefully help them understand what they can do to protect this investment. And, you know, they've along this beautiful water and what they can do um, to help, you know, protect their investment and protect the water quality. Um, and again, 
um, you know, sometimes, it, you know, this is just one more touch point, one more outreach opportunity. Um, if you're like me, sometimes I need to hear or see something, you know, what is it, seven times before I'd actually, I'm actually like, oh, that's what I need to do. That's what I'm supposed to do. So this is just another opportunity um, to increase awareness. Um, so we're supportive of this. And, and this is one of those bills uh, uh, sponsored by Representative Rosemary Rung, who I introduced you to earlier in the presentation, one of our champions for our lakes. Okay, what do we have next? Um, this bill is relative to water quality restoration and protection, one of our core priorities. This is another bill sponsored by Representative Rosemary Rung. Um, HB House Bill 1143, uh, including control of cyanobacteria blooms under the New Hampshire Lakes Clean New Hampshire Clean Lakes Program. Okay, so I talked a little bit earlier about cyanobacteria. Uh, cyanobacteria is potentially toxic. Al toxic. Um, it is, and many of you on this call know this. Um, the Toxic blooms of cyanobacteria are increasing um, in New Hampshire, increasing in severity and in duration. And uh, because of legislative action, which we were involved with over the past two years, um, the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services um, was required um, by the legislature to prepare a plan to address cyanobacteria in our lakes. Um, we were part of that advisory committee on that plan, and the plan was produced last November, November 2023. Um, and this bill is a direct result, one of the recommendations of the plan. Um, and so it's consistent with the plan. And basically what it says is establish, it would establish in law that the Department of Environmental Services should have a program to deal with cyanobacteria, to deal with the, the sources of it, the pollution coming off the landscape that are contributing to it. And DES, Department of Environmental Services, should have a program that can also manage the lake in the lake um, when blooms happen. There's a variety of different tools, um, management tools that you can use in a lake um, to manage uh, blooms, uh, but the, those aren't actively being used in New Hampshire right now because we don't really have a program or a permitting process or oversight for that. So this bill is intended to set that up. Um, so we are very supportive of this um, and we will keep you posted as to when we hear it's going to be heard. All right, I am getting to the, the, the end of this sh short list. Um, take another sip of water here. Okay, another, this is a water quality restoration and protection a core priority bill. Um, this bill, House Bill 1113 relative to shoreland septic systems. And uh, once again, this is a bill, um, prime sponsor, um, Senator, uh, Rep House Representative, Representative Rosemary Rung. Um, and just so that you know, just for the process, we, bills have prime sponsors. So, you know, the sort of the initiator of the bill, but then they get other representatives to sign on. So co-sponsors. So many of these bills have a prime sponsor and then a whole bunch of other, um, you know, representatives that have signed on. And to really promote, to help your bill succeed, a prime sponsor is going to want to get, um, um, co-sponsors to sign on that are from both parties. So both, you know, um, uh, Republicans and Democrats, um, bipartisan bills are going to, to um, you know, uh, carry more weight. So relative to the shoreland septic systems, in brief, presently, when um, a, a property is transferred within um, approximately within 200 feet of a lake, um, something called a site assessment must be completed of the septic system. And for those of you on the call familiar with this process, a site assessment generally is, is not very helpful. It's basically just a, a look um, at the property. You know, does it look like the septic system is in failure? Um, is there any evidence of, of septic failure? This bill seeks to strengthen um, you know, the kind of the looking at a septic system at the time of, of the property being transferred. Um, does a couple things, um, instead of 200 feet from the water, if, um, if this property is within 250 feet of the water, then, um, you know, we're going to have, need to have a, a, a stronger 
um, program for those septic systems. The 250 feet corresponds to the 250 feet for the Shoreline Protection um, Act. But anyway, so this bill amends the distance to 250 feet. And if that septic system is not approved by the state or is more than 20 years old, then that septic system must actually be evaluated or so inspected by a septic designer. And this evaluation is a better way to determine whether or not a septic system has failed. Um, if a this bill proposes if the system is found in failure, both the state and the state and the local health officer must be notified. Right now, the state and, and many health officers do not have a way of knowing what systems, septic systems, are failed or not. Um, this bill also requires that a failing system uh, be replaced uh, prior to sale. So, at New Hampshire Lakes, we support this bill. Um, we support it because failing septic systems, inadequate septic systems, um, septic systems. Um, can um, over time uh, really release a lot of nutrients and bacteria. It gets into surface if it's blatantly in failure and can just flow over the land and into our water resources or can seep um, into the groundwater and into our water resources and potentially contribute to toxic cyanobacteria bloom or cyanobacteria blooms and, and other uh, water quality degradation. This bill well, will be heard next Wednesday. Um, so stay tuned um, again if you're, you get our e-news. Um, and if you don't get our e-news, I should have mentioned um, at the end of this presentation, we'll let you know how you can get it. Okay, we're getting there. Another bill, Water Quality Restoration and Protection. Uh, just in brief, uh, HB 1293, relative to the use of certain fertilizers. This is a bill Monday, I uh, testified on Monday um, in support of this bill. New Hampshire Lakes is in support of this bill because basically what it's aimed at is um, a fertil uh, I should say a fertilizer that contains phosphorus. Phosphorus is the nutrient that spurs on um, algae growth, plant growth, potentially toxic, al uh, toxic uh, cyanobacteria growth. Um, so we want to limit the amount of phosphorus that gets into our water resources. Um, so this bill um, basically is targeted at retail, um, basically is targeted at, for the most part, um, the private homeowner um, who wants to, to use fertilizer on their property. Generally speaking, um, we don't need to use fertilizer that contains phosphorus. Uh, most of our soils have enough phosphorus, um, the nutrient phosphorus, but um, this bill would say if you're going, you can only buy um, fertilizer with significant phosphorus in it. Um, if you're establishing a new lawn or repairing your lawn, or if you have a soil test that says your lawn needs it. It also, this bill also does other things um, that talks about, you know, you can't apply fertilizer if you think it's, if it's going to rain or if the ground is frozen. Um, it also has some additional setbacks from storm drains. Um, you know, you don't want fertilizer going straight down the drain. Um, this bill is a little bit complicated, but overall the intent is to minimize or reduce the amount of phosphorus getting into our water bodies. And so we are supportive. Um, at the bill, at the hearing earlier this week, uh, everyone spoke in support of it. And we had about 200 folks um, that we uh, helped motivate. Thank you to all of you who signed in in support of this bill. We'll keep you posted. All right. Another bill um, that we are um, following closely this, this session is House Bill 1301 relative to wake surfing on public bodies of water. Um, this is this bill was heard this morning at the House Resources and Recreation and Development Committee. Uh, it was a hearing that went for two hours and 15 minutes. What this bill seeks to do is enable um, a group of 25 or more residents or property owners of a town where a lake, pond, or river is located to petition or ask um, the New Hampshire Department of Safety to restrict or prohibit the activity of wake surfing on that water body or a portion of that water body. Um, and we support this bill and this is why. Um, we believe that the activity of wake surfing, it can be a very family friendly, low impact, inclusive, enjoyable sport um, that can have minimal impact on uh, the shoreline and the lake bottom and, and fish habitat and loon habitat or loon nesting 
if it's conducted far from shore and in, in deep water and, and away from sensitive ecological areas. Um, unfortunately, and, and some of you on this call may have experienced this, um, when the activity of wake surfing, which requires a relatively large uh, wake, wave or wake compared to other forms of on-water recreation, when this activity is conducted you know, repetitively um, in relatively shallow water, shallow water and relatively close to shore um, can cause a whole bunch of headache for other recreationists and, and cause property damage. But what we're most concerned about is the water quality impacts. Uh, those big wakes can uh, erode the shoreline, washing in sediment. Sediment contains nutrients that decrease water quality, can stir up the lake bottom, which dis disrupts um, beneficial plant habitat. Um, bottom, lake bottom sediment has phosphorus in it, that nutrient that we that spurs on algae growth and cyanobacteria growth. So um, this activity, when conducted in certain sensitive areas, can potentially contribute to some serious water quality issues. Um, and so this is a bill that um, you can imagine is is somewhat controversial um, between um, you know people that want to um, help protect water quality, um, but then also balancing that with um, you know um, public access and being able to enjoy the sport in the in the way and where they want to. Um, and so we again are supportive of this. That one of the reasons we're supportive of this is because. This is just establishing, um, there's an existing petition and public hearing process already in place to um, you know, manage other forms of recreation on our water. Um, so this is just adding essentially uh, the ability for communities um, to um, submit a petition. Um, I would need to clarify that it is not um, when a petition is submitted, the Department of Safety looks at a number of criteria that include ecological impacts, safety impacts, property impacts, um, public access, um, you know, fair, um, everyone has access, should have access, reasonable access to our lakes. It is the Department of Safety hearings officer that makes the decision um, on the, uh, if a petition is submitted. And there's a public um, you know, process in which people can testify and, and all of that. So we feel that it's an inclusive process. And we're also um, hopeful that um, this will help communities work together um, you know, to help solve problems rather than um, you know, regulation. You know, it was always the last tool of resort, but if we have you know, an education process and a regulatory process, hopefully communities will, will work together so we don't have to go the regulation route. So this is just enabling legislation, allowing a community to petition uh, for a hearing for the Department of Safety co to consider this um, regulating. And re it could be that, you know, this activity can still happen on this water body, but it needs to happen, you know, in this part of the lake as opposed to this part of the lake. Um, a lot of devils in the details here, but just to let you know, we are weighing in on um, this wake surfing bill um, for the water quality um, connection to it. All right, so that's just a handful there of, of those, what, 50 bills we're monitoring, 15 are high priority, and that was, I don't know, five or six or seven, Aaron, I've lost count, um, but we're weighing in, we're monitoring a number of other bills too. Um, so I do encourage you to, um, this is the link to go to our website to find our masterpiece tracking sheet. Um, and after you, you know, take some time, look through that sheet. And then if you have any questions about, you know, the various bills, um, please reach out to me, um, email me, and I will do my best um, to answer your questions. And I will tell you that I am learning more and more about each bill every day. Um, and so again, our positions on these bills may change, but um, this is a great resource to find out all the other bills that we'll be tracking for you all. And with that, Yes. Yeah. So, yes, you have been talking a lot. Thank you for all this great information. Um, so how can people help give our legs a voice in this legislative session? 
Great question. Um, awesome question. And I do hope that you are all you are all wondering how you can make a positive impact for our lakes this legislative session. Um, you know, we want our lakes to be as clean and healthy and as safe as possible for all of us today and for our kiddos and their kids. So, you know, what we do today will help um, hopefully restore, preserve and protect um, our lakes for for generations. Uh, so one thing you can do, and I've already kind of mentioned this, is, um, you know, if you are not already receiving, receiving our periodic but very timely advocacy alert e-news, please sign up. Um, you can go to our website, uh, then you just scroll down to the bottom of the page in the footer, and right there you can put in your name, your email, and get this advocacy alert. I try to get these alerts out as quickly as I can when I find out that a bill or set of bills is going to be heard uh, the next week. This last one here, this is a screenshot of the alert I sent out, uh, I guess, last Saturday about the three bills we had coming up on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Usually I will try to send something out more than two days before the hearing, uh, but sometimes, you know, just we don't have the, the time we want. Um, but again, uh, so sign up to receive our advocacy advocacy alert e-news. And if you are receiving that, um, you know, when you get an alert, please feel free, free to share it uh, with others that you think might also want to know about these bills and how they can make a difference. These advocacy alerts will tell you things like, you know, what bills are coming up, you know, what what time the hearing is, where the hearing is. It will also tell you um, how you can sign in in support of the bill online. We'll get to that in a minute. It will also give you some talking points about the bills and also, you know, uh, links where you can learn more. Okay, another way you can um, make a difference um, is, you know, um, to sign in, in online in support or opposed to bills. Um, and include a statement um, or upload your letter of testimony. And if I haven't said it already, um, you know, our lakes are going to need you to, um, you know, stand up for them, to share your stories uh, the, relative to these bills. Um, they're going to need people, numbers, their numbers and personal stories matter. The more people that sign in, you know, online relative to a bill, and the more people that share their personal stories, and your personal story can be two or three sentences long, it's going to make an impact on our legislators. Our legislators want to hear from you. So if you haven't submitted, um, signed in online for a bill or submitted testimony, it's super easy. Um, you go to the general court website. I've give, included the website down here. Where's my mouse here? Oh, go back. There we go. The Gen, Gen Court, State, NHUS. When you get there, you're going to scroll down and you're going to see something called meeting resources. And for example, if you're going to um, submit testimony for a bill that's being heard in the House, you would click on this middle option here and this next screen would pop up. And it is um, really easy. It asks you your personal information. You need to know the date and the time of the hearing. We will give that to you in the advocacy alert. You'll need to know what committee. We'll give that to you. And then down, and I know you can't see this very well, but it'll say, you know, you can click on, I support the bill. You can upload a PDF of your testimony letter, or you can just type into this little box two or three sentences about why you support or oppose a particular bill. Uh, so again, numbers and personal stories make can make a big difference. Um, and then finally, consider attending a hearing. Um, and then if you are attending it, consider testifying. Um, you can absolutely, you know, the more people that are at a hearing in support, that sign in at the hearing in support or opposed to a bill, it's going to make a difference. Um, so just being there makes a difference. And then if you, if you can um, sign up to speak and share a few, you know, a couple minutes about why you support a bill or not. Again, that makes a huge difference. Um, on our website, we have a, a nice resource page on giving you some tips on how to testify. And if you do think you wanna go to Concord, um, the State House or the, the Legislative Office Building and give testimony, um, shoot me an email or give me a call so that we can coordinate our talking points and so I can let you know what to expect, you know, where to find the room and where to hang up your coat and where to sign in and, and what to say to the committee to introduce yourself, all of that fun stuff. So, and I just looked at my time here, Aaron, and I am wrapping it up here. Um, 
So I, I want to say that was a lot of information I threw at you all. You know, we have a very um, unique legislature, a very detailed process, um, you know, all the different steps for the bills to be heard and vetted. The really cool thing about New Hampshire, um, our legislature, it is, it is a citizen legislature. There are so, so many opportunities for you to make an impact for our lakes. You know, first of all, you could run to um, serve in the legislature. And if you're interested in that, please do let me know. And we'll talk about that later. Uh, but you can run to be a representative or you can talk to your representatives. You can, you know, meet with your representatives over the summer and share your ideas for bills. Um, and then you can, you know, this session, January through, through, well, we'll keep you posted, but January through at least March, probably April, May, you can weigh in on bills, sign in, in line, online, attend hearings. We need a growing group of folks like you advocating for our lakes. Um, you know, it's no secret, our lakes are facing some serious challenges, but we can make a difference. And if you help um, give our lakes a voice, if you stand up for our lakes in the legislature, you know, we hope that eventually we will achieve this mission. Our mission here is in New Hampshire lakes is that New Hampshire will become a place where all of our lakes are clean and healthy and caring for them is the way we live. It's the way we recreate, it's the way we do business and it's the way we govern. So um, with that, I want to say thank you. And I'm going to stop sharing here, I think. Yeah, thank and you, Andrea. That was um, some great information and certainly helped me understand some of these bills that we're tracking better than I had before. Um, we had a few questions that came in that are very specific that I think would probably be best if these people reached out to you after okay. uh, the webinar, but there are a couple of things that I thought we could probably quickly touch on here when we have just a couple minutes left. Okay. Um, we did have a question about the timing of when we learn about a bill and when we can notify our supporters of that mm -hmm. bill. And I know you said this last one was a very quick turnover. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if yeah. you can touch on that a little bit about how that process works and how quickly we can let people know. Right. Thank you. And, and whoever submitted the, the, the question, my apologies. I know I got a few folks saying, you know, I heard from you on Saturday morning about a bill on Monday. I know. I'm sorry. Um, this was <laughs> the legislature started out so quick and I didn't find out about these bills until Friday. But yeah, so you can expect um, uh, for those of you who are signed up um, an advocacy alert from us this Friday um, for bills next week. Um, so um, that's about as quickly as we can get things out. Um, and again, um, things should slow down a little bit after these first couple of weeks and we should get a um, notice sooner. But um, thank you for hanging in there and, and know that we're working our hardest to get that out as soon as we can. Because again, we know that numbers and stories matter. So the more opportunity time we give you all to, to reach out and, and support our bills, the better. So thank you. Excellent. Um, one of the other questions was about getting a copy of the slides. And yes, I wanted to reassure everyone that we save a recording of the actual webinar. So that is posted on our website. It actually will link you right to the recording on our YouTube page. And you can always go back to our YouTube page and find those anytime. We do also uh, upload just the slides. So that's a great resource to share because I know there was a lot of really good information on these slides tonight. So thank you again, Andrea, for that. So those will be on our website as well. I try to get all of that information up by the end of the day tomorrow um, if you're looking for it. So we try to get that a quick turnaround as well. So keep your eyes open um, for that as well. And like Andrea mentioned, we did just do a little bit of an overhaul on our website to try to give everyone more resources um, so that you can more quickly find what you're looking for and learn how to get involved. If you go to our website right now under the advocacy drop down, you'll see um, the slides that Andrea shared with you about the state government, as well as making your voice heard. And that's where you're going to find the tips about reaching out to your representatives, all that great information. If you're ever looking for something and you're not finding it, don't hesitate to reach out and ask. Um, we want to know if, if there's something that's missing that we should include and also be able to get that information to you quickly. 
So if we didn't uh, get to your specific questions, there were a couple about bills. Um, I can share that with Andrea and you can also reach out to her at her email address. Um, but don't worry, we'll do our best to get to you. And um, unless there was anything else, Andrea, I think we did a good job of finishing right here at eight o'clock so we don't take up anybody's time this evening. Um, if, there, if there's any last words. Yeah, I just want to thank everyone uh, for tuning in tonight. And again, uh, we mean it when we say it. If you have questions, thoughts, ideas, reach out to us. And I want to thank you, Erin, for putting um, pulling this together and, and providing this opportunity. So thank you. Absolutely. And thank you. So much good information to share. I hope everybody uh, is excited as we are about this session this year. And I hope everyone has a great night. And thanks for tuning in. Thank you. Good night. Bye.